Welcome back to day 25 of the 28 days of Black American History Month. I cannot believe we're like there. We're basically there, right? Um, tonight we're going to be talking about none other than the incomparable, the amazing, the talented, the light, the activist, the model, the performer, the mother of so many, um, Miss Marsha P. Johnson, y'all, um, one of our mothers for sure. Um, Marsha P. Johnson um, was a trans activist um, in New York. Um, Marsha um, started out, she's originally from New Jersey, I believe. Um, she ended up moving to New York in 66, um, a few years after she uh, graduated high school and uh she'd been there um you know waiting tables and you know um you know hoping to express herself because her life prior to moving to new york you know she underwent tons of you know you know bullying and that sort of thing um really not being able to fully be her full self um so she moved um and upon coming out and you know um, stepping into her life, um, she <laughs> never went back. She continued to be a light um, well into the end of her life. Um, she uh, was notorious for, you know, walking the streets, you know, in all of her shimmer and all of her shine. Um, she loved a good little flowy dress. She loved a good little, she loved a red pump. <laughs> she would grab her shake and go wig, honey, and she would throw that on, and she would don her crown of flowers. Um, she was notorious. That was her, like her signature. You know, she often wore her crown of flowers um, that she would get from, um, I think, the flower district, they said. Um, like, uh, leftover flowers from the flower district that she would find. Um, but, you know, you could. they always said that she was just like this fashionista. You could. You never knew what you were going to get whenever you saw Marsha. Um, and, you know, she was a light in her community. She, you know, people loved and enjoyed seeing her. Um, you know, everybody had, you know, everybody that spoke about her has had nothing but good things to say about the person that she was. Um, even aside from all the activism and all the great things that she did in her life, which only added just to the light um, that she ultimately just constantly shined um, throughout her time. Um, she was... Um, more so known, a lot of people knew her. Um, okay, well, I guess before I get there, um, you know, like I said, she was a known performer. Um, she would often perform uh, with a troupe called Hot Peaches. Um, she would sing and do all sorts of little acts. Um, she was a model. Um, a lot of people didn't know, I didn't know that she actually modeled for Andy Warhol. Um, so she was actually um, a part of his Polaroid series um, that he did in the 60s, um, or rather the 70s, uh, possibly the 60s, not quite sure. Actually, I think it was the 70s. Um, so she did that, um, which, I mean... Andy Warhol. Um, it was a Polaroid series. Um, I actually, you know what? I used to work at um, the Broad Contemporary Art Museum, and there was, we had a book of Andy Warhol's um, Polaroids. I'm, this is all coming back to me like as we speak. I didn't even think about this before, but I actually saw the book of Polaroids, um, which she was featured in. Um, I feel like that particular series was specifically on trans women. Um, not 100% sure, um, but she was a part of it nonetheless. Um, and like I said, she was just like the life of the party. She was, you know, always at the bars and, you know, always amongst the community. Um, and, you know, what she's most known for, I guess, excuse me, is, um, the Stonewall Riots. Um, <laughs> It was said, the, the quote uh, from the media, it always sounds so like, 
not cliche because like I definitely obviously honor Mother Marsha, but it the quote was I guess the headline was it was the shot glass that was thr- no uh, she thrown the shot glass that was heard around the globe <laughs> and it just sounds like you know um, which I'll get to um, but it was said that um, she threw a shot glass um, at the Stonewall Inn, which was a, a gay bar at the at Greenwich Village um, in New York. Um, the story has has been like honestly all over the place in terms of how everything went down. Um, some say she threw the shot glass and shattered a window or a mirror. Some say that she threw a brick. Some say that she didn't throw anything at all and wasn't even there at the time, which she actually confirmed um, in an interview. She said that, you know, the riot started around 1.20, um, and she didn't get there till 2 o'clock. And then when she got there, she left and went to go get her friend um, and fellow activist, her daughter, um, Miss Sylvia Rivera, um, who also is just known for her activist work um, as well. Um, and went back and, and, you know, obviously was a part of everything. Um, and then there was this, um, a story that was somewhat confirmed. Um, there was a lady by the name of Stormy um, Delveray. Um, she was also a black American um, woman. She was, she was a black American woman. She was a lesbian. Um, she was somewhat butch. She was butch. She was super butch, um, as they would put it. Um, she was gender nonconforming. Um, and... She was a bouncer at the Stonewall Inn. Um, it was said that she actually um, was the one who got the riot started. Um, she was being harassed by the police. Um, the police had ended up handcuffing her um, and they hit her with a baton in the head and like she was being attacked um, by these cops. Um, and uh, you know, it was said that she literally screamed, you know, why are y'all just standing here? Why aren't y'all doing anything? Um, you know, as we do, <laughs> as black Americans tend to have to do. It seems like a constant in our lives. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, people started rioting, um, which, you know, before, because it seems from what I've gathered from all the research is that um, initially it was just a gathering of a ton of LGBTQIA folks um, that ended up turning into that, but it wasn't, you know, the media tried to flip it and say, seem like it was just this like huge ordeal at first and it just, it wasn't that. The cops actually more so made it into that. Um, but it was said that um, Ms. Stormy Delveray, um, who was originally from New Orleans, um, and had this really interesting like history. Like I recently just I had no idea because like again, folks never really brought her up. It was, I always knew. Um, I can't say always within the last maybe uh, five, three to five years. Like I knew more about Miss Marsha, um, but I never really heard anything about. I never heard of any anything about Miss Stormy, um, who was from New Orleans. She was a Black American woman. Um, her mother. Um, was actually a servant to a white man who ended up actually being her father. Um, not sure how that went down. I know she was born in 1920, so by the time that the Storm, Storm, uh, Stonewall riots went down, she would have been about 49. Um, she died at the age of 93. Um, but she had this like full career. She was like an MC. Um, she hosted at the Apollo. Um, she performed. Um, at Radio City Music Hall. Um, she was a part of Ringley Brothers. Um, she was a bouncer. She was a bodyguard. Like, she did all of these things. Um, but it was said that she was the one who was being attacked um, and screaming, you know, why aren't y'all doing anything? Why are you just standing here? Like, why are y'all letting this happen, basically? Um, which started the riots, or so they say. Um, which more than probably, I don't know, I don't, we don't know, it's not as clear, um, but Miss Marsha has always sort of donned the, I guess, title of the one who started the riots. Um, from there, so the riots went down, um, from there, 
that was around 69. The following year, you saw a lot of um, gay liberation movements and things. Um, there were uh, marches and, 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 you know, the parades and stuff started to happen. They had one in um, San Francisco and one here in LA, um, one in New York. And it really just started a lot of like the um, movement work, I guess, that was happening in the LGBT, LGBT community. Um, which, you know, I feel like often is swept under the rug, you know, regardless of how you cut it, from what's been told, a black woman started <laughs> the gay liberation movement. A black American woman started the gay liberation movement, regardless of how you cut it. But again, often just given how, you know, even just, and I was going to say the media, but just even thinking about how the media kind of went forward, even with reporting um, this movement, um, it was said during the time that like it was um, a reaction to like Judy Garland's funeral or some shit. Um, and even still today, just thinking about like just how like, I don't know, white gays kind of like toy around with the, the history and just like blow it off and parody it almost um, with like all of the um, like I've seen um, how like, you know, how they um, do like the you know, one day uh, Britney Spears was walking down the street and she saw a, a little girl with her head hanging down um, looking over a puddle of water um, and she told the girl, um, keep your head up kid or something like that and threw a nickel at her and walked down the street. That little girl ended up being Marsha P. Johnson. Like stuff like that, like I've seen a lot of that, which is completely offensive and completely disgusting. But like the fact that they would be online doing these sort of things and just like not really taking the history serious and really kind of taking the importance and the steam away from this black American trans woman um, and not honoring her in the way that she should, especially considering she is responsible for them to have the freedoms and the privileges that they have, um, completely touring around that history, I think it's just it's super disrespectful. But that's all that we've gotten from <laughs> the white gay community, and that's all that we've gotten from um, the LGBTQ media and the media just in general. Um, moving forward, after... Um, the, I feel like, yeah, the, the year following the Stonewall riots, um, M Mother Marsha and Sylvia Rivera um, started the Star House, which is the, um, <laughs> let me get it right now, <laughs> the Street Transvestite Act. We know it's transgender, but this is the terminology of the time. The Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries House, um, which housed um, black and Latino um, LGBTQIA folks um, who obviously, you know, didn't have anywhere else to go. Typically teens and, you know, adults, you know, folks who just needed a space to stay. Um, they uh, provided, they did what they had to do um, to provide housing, um, to provide food, clothes. Um, you know, they were their chosen family. Um, and they often did, you know, activist work and things um, and just wear shoulder to cry on for all sorts of different folks. Um, what's interesting about their legacy at that point especially, um, you know, they started this house and they did all these things, but as the um, white gay liberation movement, I might as well say, I mean, it was, it was the gay liberation movement, but we all know how non-inclusive <laughs> um, the white gay movement has always been to black LGBTQ folks. Um, so much so though, um, in 73, um, they actually banned Mother Marsha and Sylvia and what they call drag queens just in general um, from the gay liberation rallies and like the movement just in general, um, they said that they gave them a bad name, which is really interesting considering the fact that they're the reason that the whole movement was started in the first place. Like they're the reason that it, the movement had become what it had became. They were the reason that all of this stuff was happening. And what I found really interesting as well was that like, nobody, 
you know, had a problem when, you know, Mother Marsha was giving the interviews, her and Sylvia and, you know, the rest of the girls. Nobody had an issue, um, you know, when they were doing all the interviews and were doing all of, like, the activism and were all around town. You know, nobody had a problem. But then whenever, you know, the movement actually started picking up, like, folks had an issue. And I'm glad that um, there's a video um, of Mother Sylvia um, Rivera, who, um, again, was a Latinx um, activist, <sighs> Mother Marsha's best friend, her daughter, um, speaking to these crowds of predominantly white gays and lesbians, LGBTQI folks, or not even T, because they wasn't even here for the T girls. They wasn't here for the T girls. Um, a bunch of white folks, a bunch of gay white folks, um, screaming at them and like harassing them. Um, somebody had ended up giving them space on the stage to be able to speak. Um, and Sylvia, you know, she went up there and I'm, I, I'm so glad that she said what she had to say. She was like, you know, your white gay brothers and sisters who getting locked up and who being discriminated against, they coming to us. <laughs> they coming to us. They writing us while they in jail. They writing to us for help. You know, they writing to Star House for help. They not coming to, they, they probably coming to you, but you clearly aren't doing anything for them. They coming to us. She was like, but what y'all not going to do, this white, and she said it, she's like, this white middle class, like, gay crowd, y'all not, y'all not going to, like, basically shit on the T-girls. They weren't having it. They was, you know, throwing their slurs and yelling at them and, you know, all of that. Um... But it just, it's very telling, um, just given the history, just in general. Um, yeah, and it's just very weird um, in general, just how, ugh, I'll get to that. I'll, I'll get to all of that. Um, Mother Marsha. <laughs> um, Mother Marsha. Um, after all of that, you know, she continued, you know, to do her, her work. Um, she continues to do her activist work. She continued to be um, a presence within the LGBT community. Um, you know, she was an AIDS activist. Um, she often spoke. She still performed. She still did her thing. Um, in 93, so the Stonewall Inn, um, it was well known that the Stonewall Inn was owned by the Mafia. Um, the Mafia in New York owned a lot of establishments, um, but particularly this one, um, which, you know, a lot of the um, gay bars and that whole sort of thing weren't ran um, by gay folks in New York, just in general. Because, I mean, a lot of the time, you know, because of the discrimination, like, folks just wasn't willing to, you know, do business with the community. Um, it was, the club was owned by the mafia, um, for, between the time of the riots, which was in, like, 69, or rather, no, um, in 1980, from 1980 to 93, uh, Mother Marsha was living with her friend, um, Randy Wicker, um, who was a white gay man. Um, who has, you know, I have to say, has upheld her legacy well, um, but there are some caveats to the story. Um, so, Randy, you know, he's been very, you know, like I said, he's upheld her legacy and, you know, he's fought to, you know, because a lot of people, you know, how should I put it? I guess I should just tell what happened. So Mother Marsha, she for a while she had been um, afraid. She'd said that you know she was being chased by the mafia and. Um, all of that, which people kind of blew off, you know, for a while, I can only presume. Um, I know for a while she had been in and out of jail, um, as the girls are sometimes, just, 
you know, it, it goes that way sometimes. Um, they also ended up throwing her um, in the asylum at one point, I think, um, which she got out um, and, you know, which is neither here nor there. She was definitely still, you know, herself. Um, she, you know, she struggled with some things, but like I said, it's neither here nor there. Um, you know, she'd said that the mafia was after her. Um, and during that time, um, Randy Wicker was um, confronting, I guess, he was warned um, because he was doing activism. He was stroking some fires around town. Um, and basically he um, was warned that, you know, the mafia, I guess he, from what I can remember, he had issues with the fact that the mafia owned, you know, some of these establishments, um, specifically the Stonewall Inn. Um, I can't recall if that's exactly what he was going after, but I know he was going after, after activists, um, doing activist work um, that I guess was um, revolving around the mafia in some way. I'm pretty sure it was about the, the, the bar. Um, not 100% sure I need to go back. I'm pretty sure though. Um, but one of his friends had told him that they'd actually been threatened um, by the mafia and that he just needed to leave it alone. Of course, he didn't pay it any mind um, and just collaborating with, with um, what Mother Marsha was said to have been you know, telling folks like she was scared to go home because she was being followed by the mafia. It kind of, you know, and especially I saw, I also saw a documentary which kind of talked about it, which is actually on Netflix. You guys should definitely um, check it out. I think it's called the, it's called the life and death of Marsha P. Johnson. Um, definitely check it out. Um, but maybe a week after I guess she was saying these things um you know she was out you know as the girls are sometimes um and some of the girls further excuse me who had witnessed her um said that you know they told her like there was a there was a car full of guidos as you know they put it um who were, um, you know, driving around. It was a, it was a car full, uh, full of, I guess, Guidos, which is, I guess, like an Italian name or whatever, or a name for Italian. Um, they were riding around, um, and the girls had told Marsha, like, don't get in that car, like, let them go about their business. Don't, don't pay them no mind. Um, ugh. I hate how you even used it like that. Um, Mar the P in Marsha P is pay it no mind. She often used that um, uh, just so folks, you know, whenever they were questioning her gender and stuff like that, she would say pay it no mind. So that's what the P <laughs> stood for, which, I mean, just says it all about Mother Marsha, um, just her and her light. Um, but, you know, they told her not to get in the car and she didn't listen. Um, and it was also reported that she um, was being chased um, by the Christopher Street Pier, which is a notorious um, pier in New York, which is where all the um, LGBTQIA folks um, would hang out, um, you know, get picked up and, and, and things like that um, if they were, um, you know, Sex work, sex workers, or whatever. Um, folks would just hang out there, like it was just a spot, you know, um, where community came together. Um, but she was being chased, um, from what it was said, and um, the next thing they knew, you know, she was found floating in the Hudson River on July sixth, nineteen ninety three, um, and it was said that she from a witness that she had like a gash on the back of her head, um, which I remember watching the um, documentary and it wasn't necessarily, like all of the evidence that they brought up um, wasn't conclusive. Um, I remember the guy said that, um, 
I guess that like like the gash could have been from um, just the body being in like warm water for so long because apparently I guess our bodies like deteriorate faster in like warm water after you pass away um, and that could have been the case the skin sort of separating um, sorry if that's too graphic um, Nevertheless, um, she was found murdered, and the case wasn't ever um, explored. You know, they kind of threw it away, as they often do with trans women, especially black trans women, who are disproportionately more murdered. Um, they didn't care. They didn't care. Um, and I think it was even, like, quoted, somebody was, like, quoted as saying that they didn't care about a gay black man or something like that, um, which says everything about how they view trans women and just how disgusting it is and vile it is and, and how they're not protected. And I don't know. It's just really, it's really fucked up. It's fucked up. Um, but, yeah. Um, July 6, 92, she was found in, in the Hudson River. Um, although it ended as tragic as it did, um, you know, her legacy lives on. You know, she inspired so many people, including myself, um, to live in their light, to be free, you know, um, the gay liberation movement and these pride movements and all of those things, the Stonewall movement, and all of these things, you know, reverberated all across the world. You know, people feel seen, people feel heard, and it's because of this black American woman, um, this black American trans woman, and doing this work that people are able to live their lives and to be free and to, um, to be comfortable within themselves and to feel seen and to and feel heard and have this space of um, activism and, and this movement and, and all of these things um, to look to, um, you know, and just even, even outside of that particular community, just as a black woman, as a black trans woman, you know, her taking up space and her saying, you're not going to count me out. You're not going to, no matter how much you try and dehumanize me, no matter how much you try and make me the lowest on the totem pole, no matter how much you try and and invalidate my life and take my agency away, take my autonomy away, no matter how, you know, you, how much you look down on me and, and try and treat me like trash. I know I'm not trash. And you gonna respect me. <laughs> you gonna respect me, period. Um, and I'm gonna walk down the street in my pumps, and I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take up space, and I don't give a fuck what you feel. Period. Um, she did that, and in doing that, you know, I always say, you know, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of blackness, with regardless of where you are on the spectrum of Black Americanness, regardless of you know what particular part of the community you come from. Um, as black folks, as black Americans, like we all have a part to play, you know, and you know, she played her part. She did her part. She did what she was supposed to do, you know, and she took up space and she made it easier for a lot of us, for all of us, you know. Her part, regardless well, like I said, regardless of what part of the community that you come from, her part was important. Her part was a part of your um, liberation. You know, because it's almost like, um, what's the, how does the quote uh, say? How does it go? Um, child, don't give me line. <laughs> but if all of us, if one of us fall, all of us falls. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of people, you know, try and count out the trans girls. A lot of people don't necessarily show up for the trans girl. I know a lot of the, uh, even, you know, the the LGBs, QIAs, like, a lot of those folks don't show up for the T-girls. And, you know, 
I absolutely adore the tea girls. You know, my sisters have always shown me love. I've always shown them love. I have nothing but respect for them. There's n not nobody that could walk through their shoes as far as I'm concerned, you know. And I've always felt seen by the tea girls and I've always felt, felt respected and loved from the tea girls. And the fact that, you know, they're disproportionately murdered, they're shed on, you know, their stories go unheard. Um, it breaks my heart. You know, I think of Nina Pop, I think of Timothy McDay, you know, who were murdered last year, you know, um, amidst all of, you know, the murders last summer that we experienced. Um, and, you know, the girls and the guys, the trans folks who, black American trans folks, black trans folks who were murdered every day um, and go unnoticed, it breaks my heart. It truly breaks my heart. And, you know, we all need to do more to support them um, in whatever we, way we can, um, because they definitely do the work. You know, all the times that I've been out doing activist work, all of the times that I've, you know, the girls were there. The girls show up, you know, the girls have been through it and, and, and a lot of our people have put them through it and they still show up. And, you know, you gotta respect that. You gotta respect that. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. You ain't gotta like whatever you don't wanna like, but at the end of the day, you gotta respect it. And you gotta know that those are your folks, period. Nobody can be left behind. Nobody, no black American left behind, child. Um, yeah, and just thinking just again about Mother Marsha and just like, just thinking about I guess in just how like hmm how can I put it just thinking about how the movement I guess the gay liberation movement and all of that just took advantage of her and just thinking about in just in general how like black gay voices, black LGBTQIA voices, black Americans, just in general, how our voices and like these movements that we create for ourselves and like, you know, our terminology, our activism, like our everything is taken by everybody and, and used for their own benefit and for their own little movements that spawn from our movements. And like all the while, very little is done in regards to supporting us. And then like, even the anti-blackness and the anti-black Americanness that goes on within these communities, like folks don't like to speak to that, but then they'll take our shit and then they'll get executive orders and shit, which I ain't even gonna get into that. We still ain't got no executive orders. Folks out here, Joe Biden out here writing all types of executive orders and shit and doing all of this shit. Um, we literally, for the past 400 years, have been murdered every day. But last summer, the pandemic, I mean, shit, last year, the, the pandemic hit. Last summer, you seeing all these damn murders. Everybody talking about George Floyd and doing all of this you know, going to the streets and doing all of this shit, but we can't even get an executive order. Y'all know what we've been going through. The fuck? Um, neither here nor there. But again, to my point, ain't nobody speaking about it. We sitting here looking like stuck and it's not really been a conversation. You know, I don't know if folks are afraid to talk about it. I don't know. I don't really care. I care about black liberation, period. But again, to my point, just how the media and all of these folks just like take advantage of our stuff and the things that we create and to use it for their own benefit and to use it to capitalize off of it and <sighs> all of these things. Um, I feel like Mother Marsha fell victim to that somewhat. I feel like, you know, 
like I said before, whenever they were banning, you know, her and Mother Sylvia, like, it was all good, you know, while you were getting what you needed from it. You know, you wanted to use our images. You wanted to use our voices. You wanted us on the front line, you know, and now here we are, you know, and even still to this day, you know, it's often said that, you know, once white gays got the privilege of getting married, child, that was the end of the road, honey. <laughs> that was that was it. <laughs> and I mean, look at where we are. Look at where we are and look at the difference in how all these different folks within these communities experiences the world and, and who's shown up for and who's not. You know, like I said, you know, all of these cases, you know, every day all these black trans women being murdered, nobody's talking about it. You're talking about, um, you know, Ed Buck a few years ago who murdered this black gay man, got him hooked, to drug, hooked on drugs. Multiple men, multiple black gay men, not even just one, it was multiple, it was like three. The last one um, actually didn't die. Um, Thank God, but like he was getting guys hooked on drugs, throwing money at him, and like two of them died in his apartment, and he walked away. And because he had like ties to the Democratic Party, he was like a donor. They let him walk. The white gay community let him walk. West Hollywood let him walk. wasn't much of a conversation. Folks didn't want to speak on it. Folks wasn't doing anything about it. You didn't see tons of folks in the streets. You didn't hear it, you know, in white gay media like that, if at all, you know. And it's just like, folks will use that whole solidarity shit when it's convenient, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. It is what it is. But with that being said, y'all, <laughs> Cause y'all know I'll go off and I'm holding back. Trust me. <laughs> I'm really holding back. I'm trying to be tactful for Mother Marsha. <laughs> but I'm so glad that she existed because, you know, had it not been for her, a lot of us wouldn't be. You know what I mean? Folks don't know until you, you know, and I don't even walk within her shoes. You know, I, I couldn't imagine what the T girls go through. But, you know, walking through this life and being somewhat feminine um, and proud. Um, as well as masculine and all of these things, but experiencing the world, how I experienced the world, and then folks who are more feminine than me, you know, who I have nothing but love and respect for, um, folks who identify as femme, um, you know, and the spectrum, you know, the spectrum of folks, um, cause it is a spectrum and, and people like to box folks in, and, but it's a spectrum of things, um, and folks need to respect that. But at the same time, you know, you don't know what it's like until you walk through those shoes and, you know, had Mother Marsha not been who she was, you know, I wouldn't be as comfortable to stand in my light. So many folks wouldn't be as comfortable to stand in their light, you know, so many folks wouldn't have the right to do a lot of the things that we have the right to do, you know, and my hope is that, like, for these next generations who are coming up who have it a lot easier than even I had it, child, um, I hope they remember this history. Like, I hope it, I hope, I, I know the millennials, child, we ain't gonna let it get lost, um, that's for sure. Um, but I hope they know just how hard it could be. Um, you know, I, I feel like, which the whole, it's a whole other conversation, but yeah, I just hope they, I hope they know. Um, you see today, folks are a child. I see some of these kids, I couldn't imagine them, like I couldn't imagine doing some of the stuff that they do growing up. Obviously now I do the hell I wanted to. <laughs> but like just thinking about like, when I was a teenager and, you know, that sort of thing in comparison to now, like, these kids have a lot of the freedoms and space that we didn't. And, I mean, that's what the work is about. Like, that's what, you know, we work for. Like, we paved the way for them, okay? <laughs> I remember I had <laughs> when I first got out here. Um, there was a guy, um, shout out to Virgo, wherever you are, Virgo. Um, we worked together at Madame Tussauds, and, you know, he was androgynous, you know, he was femme, but he was also masculine, um, super masculine, but he was also femme, he had long hair, honey, and he would whip that hair, honey, <laughs> but I remember one day, um, I was at work, 
And I'll never forget it. And I thank him so much for it. Because I was young. I was 20 at the time. I turned 21 with him. And he really showed up for me on my 21st birthday. I'll never forget it. But I was 20. And um, he's black American. And he's mixed. He's black American and Latinx. <clears throat> He showed up, and um, I remember him showing up to work, and he was like, uh, something, I don't know, I don't know what had happened, but he told me, he was like, <laughs> he gave me a little bitch conversation, he was like, <laughs> he was like, honey, I paved the way for you, <laughs> he got me together, <laughs> he was like, honey, we paid, it was another, uh, uh, gay band in the room or whatever. He was like, honey, I paved the way for you or something. He got me together and I will never forget it. And I was so, and I brushed it off or whatever and was just looking like, and I, I, you know, knew how valid it was or whatever. You know, I showed love or whatever. And it was all in good fun and all in good taste or whatever. But, you know, I'm so happy that I, you know, had that because I never had that before. I, and at that point, I never really had that much community just in general. Of course, I knew other gay folks and stuff like that. But, you know, I was in the beginning stages of my journey. Um, and, yeah, I'll never forget that. But, like, we all play our part. And that's what it's all about, you know, holding each other up and holding each other accountable and and... You know, continuing the work, continuing the work. But I'm very grateful for Mother Marsha and 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 uh, will continue to spread her legacy. That is for sure. But with that being said, that is day 25 of the 28 days of Black American History Month, y'all. I cannot believe it's the 25th day. Um, tomorrow. Tomorrow, Billy Ho the Billy Ho the Uni United States versus Billy Holiday comes out. So more than likely, I'll probably be on here talking about that, which I'm really excited about. I've been anticipating this movie for a minute. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'll probably be on here talking about that tomorrow. Um, also, I'm still reading uh, Mrs. Cicely Tyson's book. It is my goal to finish this book by the 27th. I'm, I feel like I can do it. I'm going to do some reading tonight. I'm 160 pages in. It's 406 pages. I feel like I can finish it by the 27th. Um, but if not, we'll be here on the 28th um, discussing that. Got some surprises for that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just super proud of everything that we've been discussing. I've learned so much. I'm super grateful for all of those of you who've been tuning in. And yeah, we're doing it, y'all. So I'll see you tomorrow. Um, Y'all have a good night and peace.